One of the great things about our LoRaWAN network is that it achieves some magnificent results, even though it just whispers radio signals. Unlike those noisy neighbours, the mobile telecom boys booming out their signals, by comparison, their emissions can cause us real problems when we share locations near their mobile base stations. Why operate so close to them, you may well ask? Well, first, their installations are ubiquitous. You can't avoid them. And secondly, there's no reason why they should shoulder us off the best and most convenient sites, rooftops. We need height buildings as radio, like light, radiates and provides better coverage into the neighbourhood from height. This is why so much money is spent on these tall sticks used for radio and television transmissions. In this video, we're going to look at why a simple passive metal box containing nothing more than a couple of connectors and a few short lengths of standard copper water pipe can help to insulate us from some of their transmissions, reducing interference and unwanted errors in our network. A pointless thing to do would be to connect a remote bulb to a dimmer switch and fade it on and off. But bear with me on this one. We could slowly adjust the dimmer up and down to change the lighting level using just a pair of separate wires strung out across the floor. My bionic spinning wrist allows me to vary the dimmer at an ever-increasing, almost inhuman rate. I can increase the rate at which the light is faded on and off and view the results. Replacing the image with a schematic diagram, it looks like this. I continue to increase the frequency, the rate of brightening and dimming. A point is reached where the separate wires find it hard to cope with the signal, but their performance can be improved by twisting the two together to form what is known as a twisted pair. This type of construction can be seen in a telephone or data cable. This works well for a while as the electrical signal remains in the cable, but as my wrist twisting increases further, the signal wants to break out of the cable and into the surrounding air. To prevent this escape, the signal is run through one thicker central copper wire surrounded by a protective conductor that tries to shield the signal from radiating. The new design shown here is called coaxial cable and will be familiar as the construction used for rooftop television aerials or CCTV systems. This cable has to become more and more intricate to cope with the signal as the frequency increases further still. The dimensions of the cable increases and layers of foil wrapping may also be introduced. It becomes thicker, more inflexible and more expensive to produce. As the frequency increases, the signal will not remain in the cable. Eventually, cable just will not do. What has happened inside the central conductor is that the signal has become more and more reluctant to pass along the copper. It moves onto the surface of the wire and into the air. Remove the shield and the foil and we have constructed a radio transmitter. All of the power radiates from the cable and little into the load. So give in, accept the losses, no pun intended, and use a long precision metal rectangular tube to convey the signal. This form of non-cable is called a waveguide as the tube guides the waves of energy. The signal starts to behave like water where it may be sprayed into a dish and focused at a distant point. Unlike water it does not have mass and will not drop to the ground. Conversely, a signal coming from a distant location may be focused back to a single point using a parabolic dish. And this is how a satellite receiver collects all of its radio power. Another parallel example would be a small bicycle lamp reflector collecting the rays from a small bulb and focusing all of the power to produce a much more powerful beam. Resonators. What's happening in this famous piece of film? The physics is that the crosswind is causing the road surface to vibrate or oscillate as a blade of grass does here when stretched between the thumbs and blown over. It should be clear that vibrations happen everywhere and in some fascinating and beautiful ways. A violin bow across a metal plate with sand on. Or the opera singer destroying a wine glass. It's all resonance. Tall buildings contain massive blocks in roof spaces to dampen vibrations during high winds or earthquakes. Some things are designed to resonate over a wider range, as a guitar sound box is amplifying the signal from the lowest to the highest notes. A triangle, or more specifically a tuning fork, is designed to vibrate or resonate at just one particular frequency. Graphically, we can show the frequency response as it's struck with this high peak in Q. The higher the Q, the more willingness to vibrate at one frequency, and in time, the more willingness to keep on ringing. 
Electronically, a charge on a capacitor, which is only two metal plates separated by a small gap, may be connected across an inductor, a wire-wound coil. It discharges any stored current to build up a magnetic field in the coil, which in turn decays to return the charge to the capacitor. With perfect components, this oscillation will continue indefinitely, but resistance intervenes in the real world to cause the effect to become dampened, to decay and disappear. Returning to our tuning fork, it should feel obvious that tapping the end of the fork here should produce a greater reaction than here at the base where the fork is held. Hold this effect in mind for the next section. Vibration, waveguides, capacitance, resonance and cue may now make our box easier to understand. With the lid off, we can see the input connector connected to this first section of pipe, the first element. The output connector to the last element and the third central element in the centre. The signal passes between them. It's a waveguide and the dimensions are important. The height is important, it's a quarter of a wavelength. The three elements are cut to length to resonate at the operating frequency, with the proximity of the screw heads providing the fine tuning to the precise frequencies as the electrical wave passes from input to output. More control can be achieved by lengthening the filter and adding further elements, each tuned to combine into a complete filter response, or its characteristic. The depth needs to be selected as a physical convenience and then maintained. The points here and here are where the signal is connected at the base of each of the end elements, and its positioning is similar to the position where the tuning fork was struck. If you were to connect an ohm meter here, the connection would be a short circuit at DC, direct current, but to the vibrating AC alternating electrical signal, this appears to have some AC resistance, more correctly called an impedance, represented by Z. The same applies to the output. Achieving the right impedance is similar to selecting the correct gear when pedalling a bicycle. The gearing will change depending upon the slope of the road and the power of the cyclist's legs. An impedance here of 50 ohms will ensure that all of the power from the source arriving at the input is delivered into the filter. Similarly, 50 ohms at the output will ensure that all of the power is correctly delivered to the load. Ensuring everything in the circuit has an impedance of 50 ohms is called matching the impedances, and is critical for good system performance. The impedance presented by the input and output of this filter is related to these physical distances respectively, which means they are also important dimensions. As an aside, correct impedance matching and the successful transfer of power from a transmitter into an antenna is behind the warnings that antennas must be fitted before a transmitter is switched on. Otherwise, the mismatch can cause the power to be reflected back from the missing antenna into the transmitter, causing damage. As with everything else in engineering, there are compromises in filter design. In a perfect world, a bandpass filter characteristic would look like this, where this axis is frequency and this is a loss. No loss at the top in any of the frequencies of interest and total loss everywhere else. The edges are also nice and sharp and vertical. In the real world, things are not that simple, and physical perfection is difficult and costly to achieve. With this example, a copper box would conduct more readily than this cheaper aluminium construction. Silver plating would further again improve performance, but it is expensive. Two of the most commonly quoted filter designs are Butterworth and Chebyshev. Their characteristics differ. Butterworth filters target a maximally flat response in the passband here, but do so at the cost of poorer roll-offs at either side. Chebyshev filters have improved cut-off slopes, but at the cost of potentially unpleasant ripples in this passband. There are of course other designs and good engineering involves educated compromises. In this application, a flat passband response may not be such an issue as the ISM bands available to LoRa actually consist of an array of separate channels being chirped and not one continuous signal operating right across the whole band. Our criteria will be our noisy neighbours, the mobile operators, who use these frequencies here, so a sharper cutoff would be an advantage. There are lots of interrelated design parameters and constraints in practical filter design, but luckily a number of generous contributors have developed equations and placed tools online. The most basic is here, and is a convenient web interface to a program originally written in the basic language. Just enter the values and the world is your lobster. 
Consider how the resulting output is modified by the input values selected and test the physical values offered. In this video, I hope you gain a better feel for the invisible electronic and radio signals about us and their behaviour. How they appear not to want to be captivated by the copper conductor and leak out of wires into the surrounding air as their vibration or frequency increases. We looked at how more and more complex, expensive and inconvenient cables had to be designed to contain them and two options where their frequency became so high that we just gave up the fight. First, by removing the central conductor altogether and constraining the signal inside an air gap, the waveguide, and then by opting out altogether and using a really high frequency of radio signal that parts of our body are sensitive to, called light, and the conductors became silica or plastic optical fibres. But I edited that out to shorten the video. After waves and vibrations, we saw how everything in nature tends to vibrate or oscillate. Some things slowly, others rapidly, and some with fascinating and intriguing properties. In several instances, oscillations built up to become catastrophic, with the unexpected complete demolition of a road bridge and a wine glass. We design musical instruments specially to vibrate in useful and pleasing ways over a range of frequencies, whilst others just had a single frequency, like a tuning fork. Q was the measure of willingness to vibrate at a frequency, and Z, the impedance, was the gearing required to achieve the best drive levels to stimulate and control responses. A cavity and some resonators produced a filter designed to pass a small range of radio signals without requiring any power or electronics, and trade-offs in the shape of the passband was considered. The total loss or attenuation, the passband ripple and the cutoff slopes were all engineering compromises that were shown to be interrelated in a practical filter design. We saw how all of these parameters formed the basis of a practical working example using a web-based tool. I'd be delighted if this video caused further deeper study and investigation into the fascinating world of engineering.